Welcome to In the Margins. I'm your host, Ralph Newell, and today we have with us Dr. Kimberly Britt, president of Phoenix College, which is part of the Maricopa Community College District. Welcome, Dr. Britt. Good morning. Thank you. First thing in reading your bio um, that caught my eye was that you have a daughter, I assume, that she's still at William & Mary or was at William & Mary? So she graduated from William and Mary, and she is right now receiving um, law school applications uh, or admissions. So she's been admitted to ASU so far, and she should be hearing from Berkeley, uh, Vanderbilt, and NYU in the next few weeks. Okay, good deal. No, it caught my eye because, A, I I, I went there undergrad, and my oldest daughter is, is a senior there right now. So... Oh, nice. Congratulations. And you know, they work them hard there. Oh, I know. I know. She um, comes home, like she came home the other weekend and like literally slept for like 12 or 13 hours, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I'm like, oh, so you've been partying. And she was like, no, it was, no, it was midterms. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, um, for sure. yeah. no, that was uh, that that put a smile on my face when I saw that. So so obviously, you know, over your career, you have spent time in in some uh, very diverse places. I thought um, Eastern Shore of Virginia, down in the Low Country of South Carolina, and now you're out in the Southwest uh, in Arizona. So yeah. <laughs> I'm a foodie. So w- what's better, Low Country food or, or Southwestern cuisine? Honestly, Low Country, but it'll kill you. I, you know, <laughs> it's like a heart attack in the making. But um, if there's anything I miss, it, it's the food. I, I often say if this presidency thing doesn't work out, I can open a soul food restaurant around here and um, make a killing because everybody who tries to do it, you can tell it's a knockoff. Yeah. Right, 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 right. I, no. I think the food is better, specifically in Richmond. Um, that's a growing foodie city. It is. Uh, but I am learning to love spice and jalapenos, so I am uh, I'm growing. But I think some of the best food ever uh, was my time in Louisiana, uh, Cajun and Creole cooking. Oh, yeah, that's where it's at. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I am. Um, ironically, um, what's the, today's Thursday? Yeah, tonight, actually, I'm flying down to Charleston. I've got to go to a family thing uh, in, in Hilton Head. So um, I'll meet tomorrow and tell me I'm wrong. It's true. <laughs> it's so good. Charleston uh, has great restaurants. So oh, I yeah. uh, take a few of those in. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But anyway, we'll get going here. You know, Diverse is, is media partners with Excellency in Higher Education. And so, first of all, we'd like to thank Sarita Brown and Deborah Santiago for all their hard work and shining a bright light on Latino student achievement. So Phoenix College, um, your institution was recently named a Seal of Excellencia Certified Institution. And for those in the audience not familiar with the Seal of Excellencia, it recognizes institutions for intentionally serving students, um, intentionally serving Latino students, and for demonstrating positive student outcome. And the framework for the Seal has three core components uh, data, practice, and leadership. And so, Dr. Britton, as I mentioned to you earlier, I kind of wanted to first focus on on the leadership component of it. Uh, and I'm excited to talk to you about it because, I, you know, I talk to a lot of people doing these interviews and just a lot of people in life in general. And then I meet them where they are. And I'm always like so intrigued as to how they got there. What was their journey? So I want to say, I, when I read your bio, my heart went out to you. It just broke when I read that, you know, you, you had to spend some time in foster care and you had abuse in your life. So I just want to hear, if you mind telling us, what what about your journey, um, those barriers that got you to where you are today? How did you overcome? Well, I often, when I share my story, um, I share it with students to let them know that there's nothing really that special about me and, and mm-hmm. where I am and who I've become. And, and where I landed, um, I had a lot of people um, who really encouraged me uh, and helped me uh, overcome that adversity. But what I will share is um, that journey, um, as mad as I was at the time and as hurt as I was, um, and I think because my self-esteem crumbled, I often felt invisible. 
um, and unseen and often that I didn't belong uh, in spaces. And so on my journey to becoming a, a a president of a college when I thought I really wouldn't even finish college. I am committed uh, to making sure those who work with me don't mm-hmm. feel that, don't feel that isolation. Um, and I find that that trickles down to our students. And one of the reasons that I think we're so successful at Phoenix College in large part is because of the journey I took um, and some of the cards that were dealt to me in life. I'm a, a gentle leader. I can be very passionate about things sometimes, but very passionate and and approachable. But I I think the journey to overcoming um, part of what I experienced, it was like a 10 year journey uh, Mm -hmm. to, you know, being healed. There are still scars sometimes that I um, will struggle with. I do I belong in this space, but I'm grateful for that journey uh, because it, it has brought me to moments like this uh, to an institution like this. And that's so remarkable. And I often wonder, had I not experienced all of that, Mm -hmm. would I be able to do what I do, um, at the level to which I do that? So I'm very proud of that. And I don't mind sharing it because it's it's made me who I am Mm -hmm. and it's made me a better leader. No, no, good. Thank you for sharing. You know, through those experiences that you've had, um, what experience, you know, if you could single out one thing, you know, what experience along this journey had the biggest impact in what you do for your students on a daily basis? Hiding my my junior and senior year of high school, I had moved to quite a few high schools and I had very little self-esteem. It was very difficult for me to... Um, associate with with other students because I I felt like they knew and that there was something wrong with me. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I would often go into the bathroom stall at lunchtime uh, on a hallway that was empty near the gym. And I would sit in the back stall until the bell rang because I I was at peace if I was alone because I didn't feel like I was being judged and, and all of those things. In reality, that was in here. I don't think those those students were judging me. Uh, but I just didn't know how to fit. And so when I see students who don't feel like they belong or who are insecure or who are struggling with self-esteem for whatever reason, I really, especially in this seat, do all that I can to uh, reach out um, and lift them up. Uh, I think because of who I am at the college, that carries great weight and so I try to use the perch that I've been given to really, truly uh, tap into people's souls and help them along that healing journey. The president of the university I attended uh, did the same for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would eat breakfast with me once a week, and he always called me Speedy because I ran uh, track and cross country, mm-hmm. but it had a profound impact on me, and I felt seen because the president of the college took time to have breakfast with me. So I do that with our students a lot. Oh. Um, many of them, about 75%-ish, are part-time. Mm. Um, I'm sorry, our first gen, and mm. about 80% are part-time. So these are students who are really just beginning to find their way. I heard a speaker at the Higher Learning Commission, and he talked about um, how hurt people hurt people, mm-hmm. but healed people heal people. Right. And I think when you've gone through a journey like that, it gives you and you overcome and you heal. It gives you a strength to be real and vulnerable in a way um, that others wouldn't. And I think that's the the gift that I've been given. Um, and it it doesn't just extend to our students. It also extends to our employees. Yeah. Uh, Authenticity, I think, in leadership is hard to find sometimes. Yeah, if there are leaders who are much better than I am in other areas, but this this was my gift, um, yeah. and and it has made a difference. Yeah. But it was hiding. To your question, it was hiding in the uh, bathroom stall mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. and not feeling like I belong. Because anyone who's read any literature. And higher ed knows that a lot of the reasons, particularly at community colleges, we lose our students is they don't feel like they belong. Yeah. 
um, you know, being a, a middle-aged white woman, um, I'm able to tap into that, I think, in a way that, and understand um, heart to heart and soul to soul in mm -hmm. a way that I'm not sure I otherwise would be able to had it not been for my journey. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. It's, it, you obviously were carrying a lot of stress and a lot of us are carrying stress. And so um, this is, I wasn't even intending to go this route with, with, our, with our talk here today, but you just made me think about mental health. And just wondering, you know, what you guys are doing at Phoenix to address that, especially when you see that student that's doing that type of thing. You know, are you equipping your faculty and staff um, to 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 work with students or identify students that may be having, you know, mental health issues as well? Well, I'll share with you. I lost my oldest daughter to suicide, and so. Um, about three years ago. And if, so if there's anybody who is really cognizant of uh, mental health challenges, especially for students who are in their early 20s, because it seems to sometimes present there mm -hmm. um, statistically. And that was true for Hunter. And, you know, I will share with you that we have recently lost an employee and a student to suicide. And so, you know, it is something that resonates. Uh, profoundly um, on our campus. And, you know, we, we started talking about our children attending William and Mary. Um, and that's a university that has to get in front of uh, suicide on that campus. Um, a few years ago, it had the highest rate of suicide. And I think some of that is the work, the sense of belonging, uh, the sense of, will I be able to make it? Am I good enough? Laid on top of um, just issues that, that form. So to answer your question, we uh, specifically for our students subscribe to uh, Single Stop, uh, which is, I, I would describe as a hub that has helped us to really support our students, whether that is um, getting uh, benefits um, to which they're entitled, but not, but may not even be aware. You can run kind of, I don't want to use the word report, but, but that's all I have in my head at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but it helps us to connect students to healthcare benefits, uh, counseling resources, often in the area, um, as well as funding for housing and or food. Um, like many of them don't know that they're eligible for um, uh, food support, whether that's through EBT, food stamps, et cetera. They, they're just unaware and also housing assistance. So we've had a lot of success especially in the Phoenix area with the um, cost of living increases um, mm -hmm. like in the rest of the country, but really disproportionately here um, increasing quite a bit and housing. And so we're really working with mental health. Maricopa also has a comprehensive program um, for our employees, uh, but we're really attentive to that with our students um, given what we've seen across the country. And it certainly is a, a point of concern, but we also have um, social workers and counselors uh, on staff to, to support our students, um, specifically in our uh, counseling department, our counseling faculty um, truly assist us as well. Okay, no, thank you. Well, we were talking about, you know, student success here, you know, obviously, um, you know, you've been championing student success, uh, you know, long before you came to Phoenix, but one, one piece, um, along your, your journey. You were part of the uh, implementation of the Guided Pathways program when you were in, in Virginia at Richmond, I mean, at Reynolds Community College. So, you know, I hear about a number of schools that are adopting this model or, or in the throes of it. So if you could share with them, what lessons did you learn that you could share that people could look out for um, with their implementation of, of programs like Guided Pathways? When we look at Guided Pathways, there, there are two sides. Mm -hmm. uh, there's kind of the student affairs components of guided pathways, um, the wraparound supports and provide, we often find that for our student population that what gets in their way um, is life. And so standing up supports that really help them to balance life. I think the second part of uh, guided pathways, which we're trying to work on more intentionally here in Maricopa is the curriculum side. So we've done a lot of work here and we completed that in Virginia 
um, really being very intentional and simplifying the understanding of what it takes to get through your program of study, and then putting up protective barriers, not inhibiting barriers, so that mm-hmm. students don't register for the wrong course that's not relevant to their program, because so many of them would find out when they get to the end of their baccalaureate journey, they would run out of financial aid. And so our students do move through our pipeline um, a bit differently and at their own pace, Uh, And so it is very important that we keep an eye on their uh, satisfactory academic progress, which takes into account uh, the time that it's taking them to progress, um, as well as ensuring that they're not expending um, too much money on courses that they don't need. To offer advice on how to be successful in standing that up, particularly on the curriculum side, Um, It is being very intentional and having conversations with faculty. I think that's one of the big challenges. Well, if we restrict electives, this very special course that I teach and am uh, all knowing of may disappear. And so it's finding a balance that students have choice, but are also not overwhelmed by that choice so that they can progress. Um, As you really have to have some deep and thoughtful um, and understanding conversations with faculty because they they don't want their special course uh, to disappear. And I, I think that is something we have to respect and acknowledge, uh, particularly when we're trying to develop soft skills in students. And I think the other piece that's incredibly, incredibly important is the onboarding process for students. And so we're open access so they can come into the building, but not all rooms are open. And meaning that we do have special admission programs like nursing, uh, dental hygiene, and many of them with a wait list. Um, And then some of our student population doesn't see themselves in what we might deem some of the harder programs, our STEM programs. And so we have taken really active steps here that as we construct guided pathways, as well as in Virginia, to ensure that our faculty understand the purpose um, and and how to balance that exposure with selection. I think that would be my biggest um, piece of advice, Mm -hmm. is you have to really bring your faculty along in that journey. Uh, for it to be effective and successful. The other piece, uh, and I had a lot of success with this in Virginia, was really approaching our course scheduling. So I I had followed uh, such gifted leaders like Russell Lowry Hart, who with Amarillo, uh, he's at Austin now, but he won the Aspen Prize. And one of the things that he really focused on Uh, was having his college to build a schedule where students could balance work and life and where they may be, you know, doing 12 credits, but they're doing three credits uh, in part of the semester um, and then and then other credits. Um, The second part, it enables them to really focus. Um, And in Virginia, uh, specifically at Eastern Shore, I stood up a program And it was called Take 13, where we were trying to get our students to 13 credit hours. So we did that on a Saturday morning um, where they would do two classes in the first eight weeks and two classes in the second eight weeks. And the reason that we did it was we had a data point that said we lost students around week seven. Well, it's much harder to give up if you only have one week to go. But when you have nine more to go, it Mm -hmm. it seems like a much longer journey. I had a 97 percent student success rate in that program because the the way the shore was laid out um, and the cost of fuel, they only had to come to campus one day a week. They only have a babysitter one day a week. You know, they, they only had to commute one day a week. And so it made the coursework in life manageable for those students. Um, and it was, cr- it was quite successful. Um, And would be one of the things I would also recommend is to be cognizant about how we're building our course schedules and letting students know, hey, this one course that you need to graduate is only offered every three years at night in the back corner room or or what have you so that students can plan for that. And then they don't miss the cycle uh, because they miss the cycle of that of that specialized course, there is a great likelihood that they would transfer out without getting it. And so being very, very cognizant in how we display our programs, how we support students in moving through that, through those programs and scheduling. I do think sometimes scheduling is what holds our students back because they can't find that balance and they do have families and other obligations. So the more 
attentive we are in that space, the better we're going to do. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. And I chuckled because he, he took me back to my undergraduate days. I didn't do the major I wanted to do because a class was only offered once a year and it conflicted with football. So I didn't take it and I didn't do my major, <laughs> you, know, there so, you, go. <laughs> you know, but if I had known that um, a year ahead of time, I could have taken the class at a different time. But, you know, when you see that light at the end of the tunnel, I was like, well, I'm not staying <laughs> another year. You know, <laughs> there you yeah. go. It's true. <laughs> yeah. So I got in the book and, and found another major. <laughs> but um, you were talking about with with pathways. Um, the life, um, life gets gets in the way, and so that you know intrigues me. You said that word because I was going to transition here to talk about the first program that you guys, uh, at least the first program that I'm bringing up here is um, Phoenix College is Achieving College Education, ACE, or I don't know if you call it ACE, but um, but I was intrigued by the, the family component of that. And so when you're talking about life getting in the way, and part of life getting in the way, obviously it's family, you know, daycare, elderly parents that are sick or something like that. So I wanted to know why was that included and, and what have been the outcomes that you guys have seen by um, having family be a large component of that program for your Latino students? So I'm going to answer that question by talking about uh, our women's soccer team. Okay. And women's soccer team. Um, and, and there is a connection to family there. Mm -hmm. Both of my soccer teams, this will be the second year back to back that they're going to nationals. Our men finished second last year. Our ladies won. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they're both headed back next week. So I'll be down in Tucson. Biggest mm -hmm. fan. But the reason I, I mentioned them, so these students uh, attend full time so that they can uh, be eligible with NJCAA. They have families and they all live within a 10 mile radius of the college. So they represent our community. Um, and I would say 90 percent uh, are Hispanic players mm -hmm. and they're good. They are good to be D2 and win back to back and or to right now appear back to back, but I know that they're going to win <laughs> All right. is remarkable. And so many of those young women and men earn scholarships to D1 institutions, which, you know, is the dream, right? Mm -hmm. To go and play uh, a college sport for a D1 institution, you, you have somewhere between a three and a six percent shot at that as a young person. Many of ours go. Now, the reason I tell you that is they get it and then often they don't bite on it because of the uh, compelling feeling to stay near their family. Right, right. And and that's my connection. So they, the families don't understand, do you really need that bachelor's degree? Um, they're first gen, most of them, and and they've excelled and now they have a free ride. Uh, a full scholarship to a D1 institution. And we have to really work with the families and the student for them to actually partake in what they've excelled in. Mm -hmm. The family com component in serving um, Latino students is critical. Uh, so we do a lot of family events, whether they're celebratory, uh, whether it's our monster ball, um, really engaging the family in the academic process uh, is key, especially with so many first gen. Um, and so it is understanding the supports, understanding that this is a family and environment. And if we go through it as a family, the student is more likely to make it. And so we're having more success, but we have to be intentional um, in that. And that is part of that uh, ACE program. So we have experienced extraordinary success with this program and helping the students to get ahead, but also involving the family. Um, I, I think for underrepresented populations and first gen, helping the family to understand the importance of education and the journey and why it matters um, is just as important of the intentional supports that we stand up for the students moving through that journey, whether that's funding so they can work a few hours less. Um, but 
you know, our ACE program, bringing everyone in and being intentional and having um, tutors and really the scheduling component as they progress, um, we're seeing extraordinary results. If there's anything I would double um, here, it would be that. Um, we have other ACE programs in Maricopa as well, and they are seeing success. I think because where we're located um, and some of the faculty and the team players that I have working in that space, we're really um, accelerating phenomenally in the completion of the of, of those students completing their college journey. But I, you know, I hope that answers your question oh, no, uh, through through a story of of why family matters. And, and so, yeah, we have definitely found it to be um, quite critical in their journey. Yeah, no, I mean, it's actually a very timely anecdote for me as well. My, you know, talking about being a D1 athlete, my brother was for soccer. And um, he actually this year started coaching the soccer team um, at one of the high schools in, in D.C. Wow, um, nice. He's like 90% Latino students. And um, he was saying some of them, don't even speak English. They're in, they're in the ESL programs. And I'm saying where it resonates here to bring this quickly full circle is he said he doesn't have any parental support. This team didn't win, hasn't won any games in the past two years. And this year um, he got them to the playoffs. And I think they went two rounds before, before they lost. And he said he just kept impressing upon them to try and get their parents to come. And um, he was saying that at their last game, they finally got some of their parents to come. Um, because he was really seeing, you know, that they were missing that family component. Um, so um, it's so true. You know, yeah. many of our students have to ask off for a week of work next week in order to go uh, and participate in nationals. And that was true last mm -hmm. year. So they work all week mm -hmm. um, and take a full slate of classes and train rigorously and keep up their team schedule. They're very busy. Um, yeah. And and so many of them are supporting um, their families, and and so for their parents to travel down to Tucson, which is you know an hour and forty minutes or so, depending on how you drive in traffic, it's important. And they're so proud when they're there. Exactly, uh, and that's what he was so doing. proud. And and so I do. I think your your brother uh, is wise, and especially when they're winning uh, so prominently. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's so important. It's so important. So we really um, are very thoughtful and intentional about student life activities, being family friendly, um, and then having community events. When we actually celebrated our SEAL, headcount was somewhere between 500 and 600. Oh, wow. Um, Excellent. We just had uh, a great evening of food and music and art. And I had uh, a student from another college who came to our college to print some stuff. I guess we are a little closer to their home address and they went to our library and that was their food for that evening. And he wrote me on LinkedIn and thanked me for all the, the tacos. And you, you never know um, who you're touching. Exactly. No, no, you're so right. The other program that you guys um, had that they highlighted was CURE, uh, which is your course-based undergraduate research program, um, which gives uh, Latino students critical research experience in STEM fields. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, and, you know, I often, you know, read about and hear about all these different STEM programs that people have, especially for students of color. And, you know, all the time that goes into it. And then I'm like, you know, why don't they replicate this for other programs? You know, everything is not just STEM. So I was very excited to see that you guys were trying to replicate this into other fields of study. So if you could tell us about what you guys are doing with CURE and how that's working. Yeah, I, you know, it's so timely. I was at the um, Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities last week. Haku, oh, yeah, you were there. And... Um, in the opening remarks, you'll recall the conversation about we're having some progress in helping Latinos move through their associate degrees, but we're not seeing it at the bachelor's degree transfer level um, success rates. Like, And so it's not representative uh, of our country um, and our demographics. And so that's an area of focus. So the reason that we have um, our course based, our cures program, course based undergraduate research is for that reason, but not just transferring to any program. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but to uh, for these students to feel confident and to be competitive in acceptance to STEM programs, particularly engineering, et cetera. So to reduce the barrier, uh, we applied for and were awarded um, a National Science Foundation grant uh, for HSIs to implement course-based undergraduate research and to really extend the components of that classroom. And so what we have there is a high practice, a high impact practice, particularly for these students, um, including um, improving their self-confidence, their communication skills, um, and increasing the likelihood that they would pursue STEM careers. And so it's kind of an immersive experience mm -hmm. uh, with great intentionality. Um, and we are seeing success. Um, so far, 471 uh, Phoenix College students have completed um, a cure uh, project and of those 285 identified as Latino, 73% um, are first gen. And so it goes back to everything that we've been talking about. And, you know, we have a lot of transfer programs at Phoenix College um, and partnerships with ASU. And our Cures program success is in part because we're working with a lot of thought partners around the country uh, on this project, Miami-Dade, ASU, uh, several colleges uh, in um, California as well. And so it's really a community college university partnership um, so that we are truly standing up practices um, that allow our students to succeed at higher rates. It's also, we're seeing significant differences uh, for these participants in earning an associate degree. So not only are we helping them to transfer successfully, but mm -hmm. we have a higher completion rate for students who participate in cures. I think a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, I'm a, an advocate and understand uh, quite profoundly the importance of the students' interaction with faculty outside of the traditional classroom experience is critical to their success. Um, you know, we always say faculty are powerful. Well, they are also quite influential on in whether or not some of these students make it or don't make it. And this program points to that because it increases the time and the experience uh, and the supports for these students who are participating. Um, and so it's quite profound and significant, in my opinion, um, and completing the associates is the first step to that transfer and being successful. But the second piece is really feeling like, just like I was talking about, I belong here, mm -hmm. I'm seen, I'm valued, and I should be in this space. Um, so we don't have our students hiding in the bathroom stall, right, when it comes to the STEM um, jobs. And that's a growing uh, technology, education, uh, applied mathematics careers are really growing in Phoenix quite profoundly. Uh, we're becoming kind of a, a second Silicon Valley in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so it is so important that um, the students who are entering those fields uh, are representative of our community. Uh, that That's why we're participating here. Um, and it it's really just extraordinary, the impacts, but high impact practices uh, cost us, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what it takes to help our students get through. And like I said, I did see that you guys were also doing this in some of the other fields of study, which, what, um, what non-STEM areas are you looking at? The, you know, I would say second to that, probably in our arts, where we're very okay. intentional, going to go off track here a little bit, but uh, kind of bringing our conversation kind of full circle with mental mm -hmm. health. Um, mm -hmm. I have been to several events where students are talking about their art. We have special uh, performances and opportunities for our students to display their art, tell the story behind it. And it is powerful. Uh, some of it is painful. Some of it is celebratory. Our Hispanic students and our uh, indigenous students are the ones who are really so active in this space, but that self-expression is part of their journey. Even if they're not majoring per se in an art uh, degree, 
um, but it is something that they're doing cursory as they're moving through their program of study. It's important to these students mm -hmm. uh, in a way to express what's on the inside um, and, and heal if necessary, um, but to all, also celebrate their heritage, uh, their communities. Um, so we're doing a lot of work in that space. Um, we recently, I don't have the name handy, but mm -hmm. did um, a production, a theater production in Spanish uh, for our community, for our students. Um, and I think it's the second time that's been done um, in our country. So I'm very, very proud okay. uh, of the work that we're doing to create that sense of belonging uh, mm -hmm. and sense of presence for our students. Okay. No, thank you very much. We're getting sort of here towards the end of time here. That was, um, wow, this conversation didn't go where I thought it was going to go. <laughs> But, you know, uh, gosh, you got to be thinking not to be insensitive. I'm not trying to be there. But um, when you're talking about being in the stall and then I was just sitting here looking at something else about you, that you apparently like to sing. So, I do. Ooh, I didn't know if you, when you spent that time in the bathroom <laughs> where you I wasn't singing, singing in there. I was hoping <laughs> anybody would catch me so I wouldn't right, have right. to go to detention. I wasn't supposed to be there. But right. um, I know we all think we sing really good in the bathroom. At least I do. I wouldn't try I, it. Well, the acoustics really are exactly. nice. Um, but, you know, I, I've done a lot of singing. Uh, a little known fact about me, when I was an English professor in South Carolina and a department chair, I sing the national anthem every year. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, at our commencement, a cappella. Mm -hmm. um, every year I'd be like, oh, why did I do this? Um, and then <laughs> when I became a vice president at Reynolds, uh, the president asked me if I would sing it. And I said, sure. And when I finished, I looked at my phone and I had all, all of my deans were writing me. I had five deans and five associate deans. And they're like, man, whew, you didn't embarrass us. We really didn't think you could do that. And I was oh. like, man, really? And so there you go. Okay. Uh, I, so haven't, I haven't done any singing here on the mic check. I sang like <laughs> two bars of the national anthem last year and they I thought that was a recording so yeah oh, wow. okay so I'm not gonna put you on the spot today so but I will ask you so what, what do you prefer better um American Idol or, or, the, or the voice American Idol I watched it in its early days and then yeah. when Simon left I I stopped uh, <laughs> watching because he was he was the entertainment um and I I just I watch the voice reels um instagram yeah. so somebody comes up and does a good one yeah. uh but yeah american idol never yeah. audition i i know what not to do so <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. and um again you got me and i was reading it you like to run so i was thinking i was like man running here on the east coast especially in the summertime is really hot then i was like well it's hot in phoenix too <laughs> So you know, you know, I, I will share this for students mm -hmm. who are trying to heal um, a sport, no matter how good or not good you are, is critical in the healing journey. It was my coach um, who turned me from kind of that victim mindset mm -hmm. uh, to uh, a survivor. He, he truly had me believing I could become anything. And I called him all the way through my journey, through my doctorate. Um, and he kept reminding me um, that I was capable. So whether it's an athletic coach uh, or or a support coach, mm -hmm. never underestimate the value of that. It's so important. Okay, I don't think we could end on a better note. Dr. Britt, thank you for your time. I really thank appreciate you. it. You're welcome.